Hi, my name is uh, Abhishek Deshmukh, one of the electrophysiologists at Mayo Clinic. And today I'm going to talk about ECGs in congenital heart disease. And uh, congenital heart disease is fairly common as most of the patients who got operated as a child are living up to adulthood. And it is also not uncommon for us to pick up certain congenital heart disease which get uh, manifested in the adulthood. So hopefully this little primer on ECGs may help you to understand and how to approach patients uh, with um, abnormal ECGs and when to think that there might be a congenital heart disease which is uh, hiding somewhere. So I have no disclosures. At the outset, I would like to acknowledge Dr. Edwards who has done some pioneering work and has maintained an incredible atlas of uh, uh, specimens and pictures of various cardiac pathologies, including patients with uh, congenital heart disease. So we'll start off with an ECG. So 37-year-old male with uh, dyspnea and has a murmur. If you look at this ECG a little bit more carefully, the patient has sinus rhythm, right axis deviation, right ventricular hypertrophy, and some STT changes suggestive uh, of uh, hypertrophy, potentially right ventricular hypertrophy. So when we have an ECG like this, few other observations on this ECG is going to be this notching what you can see in the inferior leads. So you have a P wave, QRS, activation kind of goes down, goes up, goes down, goes up again, and then you get uh, repolarization. So this notching is fairly typical. This uh, resembles a crochetage uh, a needle or a crochet needle with the beak, which is notched like this and gives us this appearance. And this is fairly typical for uh, ostium secundum uh, ECG. Now we know that in patients with uh, ASD, we can have multiple different varieties of ASD, but ostium secundum defect is generally a defect at the level of the fossa ovalis. And uh, one thing important to know that because it is away from the AV septum or away from the AV node, the conduction system is generally normal in uh, patients with uh, ostium secundum ASD. Now what happens in ostium secundum ASD, there is blood which is going from the right atrium through this defect into the right atrium. So blood is going from left atrium to the right atrium. So the right atrium enlarges because it is getting more volume of blood going into the right atrium. That sends blood to the right ventricle so the right ventricle enlarges and that sends blood through the right ventricle outflow tract, pulmonary artery into the lungs and then it comes back again to the left atrium and forms this cycle again. So with every cardiac cycle, there is more and more blood which is coming on the right side of the heart. Now if you look at a normal ECG, a QRS is formed by a summation of activation going over the left and the right ventricle. The predominant vector, because the chest leads are placed on the left side of our chest, the predominant vector is created by the left ventricle. So when you start to see changes of right ventricular enlargement on the ECG, that suggests that already significant right ventricular enlargement has already happened because once that happens, that's the only time that the axis is going to change and you would start to see changes consistent with right ventricular enlargement. It is also common that in patients with ASD, you have an RSR prime pattern in lead V1. Now the reason why we get that right bundle branch delay pattern is again because of so much volume of blood coming into the right ventricle, that sends blood to the right ventricular outflow tract. So the right ventricular outflow tract also enlarges and the last part of the heart to get activated in the right ventricle is actually the right ventricular outflow tract. So because of volume overload as the RVOT also dilates, 
uh, this gets manifested as a delayed conduction which is happening in this part of the heart, RVOT. And the lead which is closest to it is V1 and that picks up this delay. That's why you get a right bundle branch delay or incomplete right bundle branch block. There's actually nothing wrong with the true right bundle branch conduction. It is just because of significant delay due to RV and RVOT enlargement that you get this finding. Now, right ventricle is an extremely important chamber in patients with congenital heart disease. So we need to be aware about how to pick up right ventricular hypertrophy and right ventricular enlargement. So generally, if the axis is rightward, more than 110 degrees or more, start thinking of RV enlargement. Dominant R wave in lead V1, at least more than seven millimeter, or an R to S ratio more than one, start to think of right ventricular enlargement. The S wave is also going to be smaller or shorter in patients with RV enlargement. On the contrary, there is going to be a dominant S wave in lead V5 and V6. So once we see that, start to think of RV enlargement. And generally, a QRS is narrower than 120 milliseconds. So the change what we see here of a small R, uh, R tall R, S, small R prime pattern is really not a right bundle branch block, but just a right bundle delay because of slowing of conduction due to chamber enlargement. Now the accuracy for ECG criteria for right ventricular enlargement is quite variable. It turns out it is least specific in patients with chronic lung disease, followed by in patients with pulmonary hypertension, but if you have an RV enlargement based on ECG for in patients with congenital heart disease, for sure they have an RV enlargement which is going to be noted on an imaging study. So these criteria are quite sensitive and specific for RV enlargement and that may clue you in again to see whether there is an underlying congenital heart disease uh, for the patient. Another case I wanted to show is of a 69-year-old man who comes in for evaluation of a palpitation and he tells you he had a surgery when he was about 12 years of age. And this is the ECG. So sinus rhythm. Again, a right bundle branch delay pattern. But now you have left axis deviation, which is different than the right axis deviation what you saw earlier. Now, when the patient has palpitations, he gets an ECG, which shows uh, atrial fibrillation. So whenever there is a concern for right bundle delay with left axis deviation and uh, arrhythmias, then another ASD comes into picture, and that's the ostium primum ASD. So this ASD is a defect at the level of the AV septal location so because it is close to the AV septum, another important structure which hangs out here is the AV node, because of which at baseline, these patients are going to have a slightly prolonged PR interval compared to an ostium secundum ASD. Another important thing to note is that the reason they have left axis deviation is because the, as the defect is more close to the AV septum, the entire conduction gets displaced more downward, and you can also have hypoplastic left anterior fascicle. And due to that, you get this left axis deviation pattern. So the conduction system is abnormal in patients with ostium primum ASD, but the conduction system is normal in ostium secundum ASD. The reason for atrial arrhythmias in them is because of this presence of a primum defect at the level of AV septum. These patients are also associated to have or known to have cleft uh, mitral leaflet. That results in significant mitral regurgitation, left atrial enlargement, and subsequently atrial fibrillation. So whenever an adult person comes in atrial fibrillation and has this funny axis with the right bundle delay and left axis deviation, slightly prolonged PR interval at baseline, 
try to see if a small ostium primum ASD was noted uh, on an echo study. Moving along, another type of ASD which is noted is the sinus venosus ASD, which is basically a communication between the right superior pulmonary vein and the superior vena cava. Now what happens here is that in this location you also have the sinus node. Because of the defect which happens at this level, the sinus node kind of gets pushed downwards. This is a typical ECG of a, ostium, uh, of a sinus venosus ASD. You can see the P waves are kind of inverted in the inferior leads and we may wonder whether this is actually an ectopic rhythm which is going on. It turns out this is still a sinus rhythm. You can also note that the PR interval is shorter. The reason why that happens is that we know that in the heart when a wavefront is going towards an electrode, a positive wave is made. Whenever the wave is going away from the electrode, a negative wave is made. And whenever it is somewhere in the middle, you get this biphasic uh, QRS complex. With sinus rhythm, with sinus node at its usual location, as the activation is going from superior to inferior, generally inferior leads show a positive P wave. But what happens sometimes if the sinus node itself gets shifted down, or there is an ectopic rhythm coming from the inferior part of the right atrium, you get a, a negative P wave in the inferior leads. Now what happens in sinus venosus ASD, because your uh, sinus node gets deflected downwards or moved downwards, you, it gets closer to the inferior part of the right atrium and that's why you get a little bit of a negative wave in the inferior leads. The reason why we get a shorter QRS or the uh, shorter PR interval is because a normal PR interval is the duration or the time duration between onset of atrial depolarization to the onset of ventricular depolarization. So common thinking is that it is basically conduction happening in the AV node. But turns out it is actually conduction in the AV node along with conduction happening in the atrium also. So as the sinus node gets deflected more closer to the AV node, that atrial conduction time is shorter and that's why sometimes you get a shorter PR interval in patients with sinus venosus type uh, ASD. So again, the sinus node kind of gets a little bit deflected down and gets closer to the AV node. So this whole duration gets much less and then you get a shorter PR interval. And as the sinus node gets deflected lower, you get a negative or you could get an inferior, uh, or inferior P waves which are uh, negative in the inferior leads. We'll come to another case of a 37 year old male with uh, shortness of breath, multiple procedures in the past, and now based on the, our recent review, you, we are all tuned to looking at lead V1. This is a little bit unusual. You have an R wave, maybe some notch, a big R wave and no S wave in lead V1. You know, may doesn't give an appearance of an accessory pathway in the other leads. Right world axis, but a very big positive R wave in V1. So certainly there is RV enlargement going on. When we approach patients with congenital heart disease, as we talk that right ventricle is the most important chamber, it's also important to know whether there is a right ventricular volume overload or right ventricular pressure overload. If there is a right ventricular volume overload, as we saw in patients with a shunt lesion, uh, atrial septal defect, you get this RS, uh, uh, RS, R prime uh, pattern incomplete right bundle branch block pattern. But if you have an RV pressure overload, you get a predominantly monophasic R wave or a monophasic R prime wave here. So this is a little bit different compared to volume overload that it's mostly monophasic and a very predominant R prime. No S wave. The second thing is yet sometimes you also get this notch which is in the upslope of the R wave. And that is again because of pressure overload, the right ventricle becomes hypertrophied and that causes scar in the right ventricle. 
and that can cause some slowing of conduction. So this notching basically just represents that as the activation is going towards that electrode, because of some scar or uh, a substrate, the conduction becomes slow as the wavefront progresses through that and that creates this notch. So it's important to know when we look at these EKGs that differentiate whether the underlying condition based on the ECG, is it related to volume overload or is it related to pressure overload? So this is a classic example one would see in patients with pulmonary valve stenosis that because of the pulmonary valve stenosis, they have significant RV pressure overload and that's why they get this predominant R prime pattern. So another ECG, 35-year-old person with complex congenital heart disease. Uh, as you look at this, you'll notice there is atrial pacing going on. But something important, for sure there is a very prominent R wave here, but the axis is not that right world. So that doesn't fit what we have discussed or talked so far. And then the QRS transition is a little bit interesting. And it's also that the R to S is quite similar in the precordial leads. The R wave and the S wave amplitude is quite similar in the precordial leads. So what would that be consistent with? So whenever you have a combined ventricular hypertrophy, meaning you have right and left ventricular hypertrophy, how to identify that uh, uh, in, on an ECG? So in the presence of a left ventricular hypertrophy, additional signs which can indicate a right ventricular hypertrophy are going to be right atrial enlargement, right axis deviation, tall biphasic QRS complex in multiple leads, and deep S wave in lead V5 and V6. On the contrary, in the presence of right ventricular enlargement, additional size signs which can suggest left ventricular hypertrophy is going to be tall R wave and deep S wave in V2 to V5, and this QRS amplitude more than 50 millimeter. So something important to think about. Now this tall biphasic QRS complexes, uh, when there is tall R wave plus deep S wave, that's called as cat's walk tail phenomenon. And this can be seen in many conditions with combined ventricular hypertrophy, uh, more commonly seen in patients with a ventricular septal defect. So identify whenever you have a chamber hypertrophy, but the axis doesn't fit, think there might be another chamber hypertrophy happening at the same time. So in summary, as far as our part one uh, talk is concerned, ASD EKGs, they have a right bundle branch block pattern, but they don't have a true right bundle branch block. If there is right axis deviation, think of ostium secundum ASD. If there is a left axis deviation, think of ostium primum ASD, but those patients will also have a slightly prolonged PR interval. And whenever there is prolonged PR interval, start to think some defect at the level of AV septum. So think of primum ASD along with some sort of AV canal defect. And atrial arrhythmias are common in these patients. So I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much.